Welcome back to another episode of Swamp Stories. For this episode, we touch an extremely important part of LA. A wild story that many people have no clue about. But before we get into it, make sure to leave a like and subscribe if you're new. You can also follow the Instagram page as well. So let's get into it. East LA. Definitely not a neighborhood that tourists or outsiders ever think of. When you want to visit the fancy areas, you definitely do not go to East LA. And when you want to visit the trenches, you also don't go to East LA either. It's really really a weird place because it's too nice to be considered a bad area and it's not nice enough to be desirable. But in reality, it's one of the most interesting neighborhoods in the entire city. It's filled with great culture, amazing food, tattoo shops, and most importantly, the renowned car culture. So if you have a lowrider or Chicano style tattoos, just know that it started in East LA. Oh, and it's also filled with no sabos. But with all the good comes another element as well, a dark side of East LA, an extremely divided history of neighborhoods neighborhoods and territories have overshadowed much of the area's positive attributes. But in order for the video to make sense, let's head all the way back to the start. Ever since the land was first occupied, it has constantly changed ownership. Over 2,000 years ago, the Gabrielino Indians settled the land which would be later known as East LA. That was until the 1700s when the land was taken over by the Spanish. And by the 1800s, the entire land was owned and occupied by the Mexican and Spanish ranchers. But by the 1900s, it was developed as an urban neighborhood by Jewish, Russian, and Japanese immigrants. Now, before everyone goes crazy in the comments, back in the day, anything east of downtown was East LA. That includes Boyle Heights and Lincoln Heights too, so for later in the video, please don't hit me with the usual all your information is wrong comments. Anyways, the 1930s brought major change to East LA. A large influx of Mexican immigrants moved into the neighborhood, and for whatever reason, the previous residents began moving out by the thousands. Many of them moved to brand new suburbs such as Compton and Watts. And I know that may sound like a joke, but it's not. During this time, all of that was brand new suburban neighborhoods. Well, by 1935, East LA was 97% Hispanic and all the businesses had been replaced. Not to mention that this happened to be in the middle of the Great Depression. And because of this, the local economy was not very good and the vast majority of residents were living in poverty. And we all know what these circumstances lead to, the formation of Los Angeles County's first gang. Let me introduce you to the Maravillas, also known as MV. The name Maravilla means marvel and wonder in Spanish, and at first it represented what they stood for, unity and progress. At the time, the tensions were really high between East LA and the neighboring communities, and for that reason they felt like they needed to join together for protection. So MV expanded to 700 members pretty quickly and had a grip on the entire East LA. They formed into 19 different groups, each representing their specific street. For example, you have the Arizona MV who represent Arizona Street. So each group kept forming and expanding their respective territories with no pushback. That was until a similar group began forming as well. In the Boyle Heights neighborhood, a group called White Fence began emerging quickly. They grew to be just as large as Maravilla and held equal respect in East LA. And I know the name sounds silly, but it actually has some significance. It represents a literal white fence that divided East LA from the neighborhood communities. So this proves that they formed initially as protection from outside elements, not their own community. I know that most people roll their eyes when they hear this, but in this case it's actually true. Well that was the case for about three to four years. During this time span, MV and White Fence coexisted peacefully and had one common rival. But as the rival kept moving farther and farther away, the groups had no reason to exist anymore. That was unless they themselves became rivals, and by 1939, that's exactly what happened. It all started later in the year when White Fence claimed the lives of two MV members. And the worst part is that they left them in the middle of Whittier Boulevard for the entire community to see. This incident sparked a trend of events in East LA between Maravilla and White Fence. And here's a fun fact. It was officially the first rivalry in the history of Los Angeles and that was declared by LAPD, not Swamp Stories. However, there is very little information known about the first decade or so of the story. All we know is that the 1940s were run by Maravilla and White Fence. It essentially made Boyle Heights and East LA rival areas. So let's fast forward to 1957 because this year brought the first 
major change to East LA. This is the year when La Eme first formed in San Quentin. It all started off as protection for LA inmates located in Northern California facilities. And basically it was set up to where you joined La Eme when you were locked up. But when you were released, you went back to your old neighborhood affiliations. Well, over the years, the East LA guys who were released from San Quentin decided to bring La Eme back to the streets. In retrospect, this was the worst decision they could have possibly made. You'll see why. This was a serious commitment. What it essentially does is remove the ability for members to make their own decisions. On top of this, La Eme is not an organization you can ever leave, and if you ever try to, you will not last long. You know, kind of like me. You know, I don't last very... Shut up, no one cares. And lastly, it means that there is no interfighting between so fellow good. members. And here is where things get interesting. Both Mata Villa and White Fence became a part of La Eme. This meant that the rival sections were now under the same leadership. So did this mean that the rivalry was over? Yes, but only on paper. You'll see what I mean. In order for this to make sense, let me introduce you to the most important character in the whole story. A man named Robert Salas, also known as Robot. He grew up in the Ramona Gardens projects, located in the Boyle Heights neighborhood. This is one of the most notorious neighborhoods in all of LA. But at first, his main issues didn't stem from the streets, but rather his health. As a young child, Robert was diagnosed with polio. This caused him to have a serious limp and to be stiff in the back. So because of this, the neighborhood kids would nickname name him Robot, which would stick for the rest of his life. Growing up, he was known to be an angry kid who instilled fear in everyone he came across. So by the time he was 16, he was fully immersed in the Ramona Garden section of White Fence. These guys are known as Big Hazard, and because of this, his main rivals were the El Oyo Maravilla. But once both groups became a part of La Eme, all of that was forced to immediately stop. But for Robot, nothing was going to stop his dislike for El Oyo, so he would find new ways to continue the rivalry without breaking the rules. In order to impose his will, he knew that he needed to climb the ranks of La Eme, and the only way to get started was to receive a strike. So in 1966, Robot committed a 211 in downtown LA, and he instantly got caught. Now, rumors say that he got caught on purpose, but do you guys really think that somebody would do that? Well, if that's the case, then his wishes came true, because he got a hefty sentence up north. And in 1968, Robot was given his first task in order to join La Eme as a leader, and for him, this task was right up his alley. Apparently, a fellow member named Manuel Romero was not following his orders, and it so happens that he's from El Oyo Maravilla. How perfect. So Robot pounced on this opportunity to climb the ranks while getting rid of an old rival. This is of course while understanding that he will never get out after this. So the next day, he walks around the yard looking for Manuel Romero. He sees him, approaches, and you guys know what's next. Romero ended up surviving. However, However, Robot was still promoted to top rank, and rumors say that over the next 9 years he was possibly responsible for over 100 bees in East LA, the majority of which were at the disposal of El Oyo Maravilla. So on paper, the Maravilla vs White Fence rivalry was not happening, but in reality it was, just happening in sneaky ways. For example, maybe Robot would put a target on an MV he didn't like and make up a reason why they betrayed La Eme. He was violating every rule and procedure in the book, and it all peaked in 1977. By this time, Robot made it all the way to the top, and he decided to take advantage of this position and use it for his own desires. So he appointed his right-hand man from back home to handle all of his tasks. That would be Alfie Sosa from Boyle Heights as well. And this guy was extremely loyal, even to a fault. He would literally do anything for Robot. Well, he got his first call from Robot on January 22, 1977. Robot informs him that he's upset with a fellow member named Alfred Cuate Jimenez who just happens to be from El Oyo Maravilla. Robot claims that the man tried to disagree with him during a conversation, South and because Gang of that crazy incident, he needed to go. So on the morning of January 22nd, Alfie Sosa follows the man all the way to Highland Park. So as Jimenez is getting out of his car, Alfie approaches. Bam. Just 9 days later, Alfie Sosa would get another call from Robot. This time it's regarding a man from Fresno who he doesn't like. The man's name is Gilbert Royball, and according to Robot, he just wasn't trying hard enough. Yes, you heard that correctly, Robot wanted to get rid of the man because he wasn't trying hard enough. This violates a major rule, but Robot does not care. February 1st, 1977, Alfie Sosa drives up Highway 99 to Fresno, and after 3 hours of smelling cow poop, he finally arrives at Gilbert's home. He 
pulls into the driveway and notices an open window in the front. You know, because no one in Fresno can afford AC, of course. Well, Alfie Sosa climbs into the house. Bam. And just when you thought that it couldn't possibly get worse, 10 days later, Alfie Sosa would receive another call from Robot. This time regarding a man named Bruno Chavez from El Oyo Maravilla. Why, you might be wondering? Well, Bruno wasn't fully respecting him, and that's all it took. Yet another violation of the rulebook. And that takes us to February 11th, 1977. Alfie Sosa drives to Atlantic Avenue Park in East LA, and right there is Bruno. Bang! Well, after this string of uncalled for events, La Emma began to seriously question their leader. They realized that he was selfish, and rather than looking out for the organization, he looked out for himself. But here's the problem. Everyone was too scared to speak out, so it would continue for quite some time. And that takes us to the 1990s, probably East LA's worst decade of all time. Obviously, at this time, the entire world was focused on South Central due to the national attention. But East LA was just as bad, if not worse. The only thing is that nobody was paying attention to what was going on. However, one story would make the national headlines in 1992. This is the year where a movie called American Me was filmed in East LA. The story is about a young man surviving the streets of East LA. Well, in order to make the movie, the director hired some locals to help out with the accuracy. Hmm, if only I could find someone like that. So the movie directors chose to work with the locals from Big Hazard. Well, the movie was released on March 13th, 1992 when La Eme was pissed. They simply did not want the world knowing what they were doing. So once they found out that their own members were helping out with the movie, it was all over. Bad, bad news. The first man they heard about was Big Hazard's Charles Manriquez, and all he did was show the directors around the Ramona Gardens. March 25th, 1992. Charles Manriquez is casually sitting outside his Ramona Gardens apartment. That's when one of his friends approaches him. Charles stands up to greet him, but the man is not there to shake hands. Bang! This incident shocked everyone because who thought that it was really that serious? I mean, after all, it was just a fictional movie. So after this, a lot of the locals were scared to be outside, and the next target would be a 60-year-old woman who helped out with the movie. On May 12th, 1992, she would meet her fate right outside her home. This one was way too far. I maybe understand disciplining a member, but a 60 year old woman who has nothing to do with the streets? That's ridiculous. And the police felt the same way, so major investigations began. Eventually, this led to a 40 person indictment. However, that wouldn't stop one last incident from taking place. August 7th, 1993, a big hazard member named Rocky Luna is leaving his Ramona Gardens apartment. Bam! This is truly where the world got scared of La Emme, and the movie director was forced to have 24-7 security from then on. But as crazy as it sounds, this wasn't even the biggest news of the 1990s. The next year would bring the unthinkable, and that takes us back to the Maravillas. After flexing their muscles in 1992, La Emme started falling in love with their power. So in 1993, they decided to impose a tax on every neighborhood that belongs to them. So it's kind of like a Costco membership fee, except I don't know exactly what you get in return. Nothing really, or at least that's what I would assume. Well, this new tax did not please anyone, but nearly every section caved in. Whether it was due to fear of La Eme, or maybe they just love paying taxes. By this time, La Eme had control of anyone wearing blue. So every section in LA agreed, from Big Hazard to Tortilla Flats, Maywood, and so on and so forth. Except for one group, the Maravillas. They put their foot down and said, nope, we are not paying anything. They're pretty much like the Fresno Bulldogs of Southern California. Well, here's what would happen next. La Eme decided to put a green light on all 19 Maravilla groups. This meant that it was on site at every moment. Not any moment, but every moment. And the crazy thing is that Maravilla expected this 100%. So you might be wondering why they would do it then. It's because they always felt like they were getting the short end of the stick, especially from robots. So honestly, it's respectable and took a lot of courage. But what this did is kick off the big hazard versus Maravilla rivalry, just like old times. It resulted in hundreds and hundreds of incidents, I kid you not. Basically, any Southsider is supposed to be rivals with the Maravillas, so this makes life extremely complicated for them. They always have to move around very carefully and always make sure they know who they're doing business with. And as crazy as this may sound, Big Hazard nor the Southsiders have caused the most problems for Maravilla. They themselves are their own worst enemy. In the early 90s, the Maravillas started interfighting. Let me break it down. The Maravillas' biggest sex is El Oyo, and 
they're rivals with Gage. Then Mariana is rivals with Ford and Fraser. And finally, Juarez is rivals with Gage and Pominoy. This is why it's extremely hard to put together a cohesive story for the 90s and 2000s. You never really know what's going on and very little is known about who has done what. And on top of this, LAPD's main focus has been on Big Hazard anyways. And that's because of a trend they started in 1993, so let me set the context. The 1980s and early 90s were so bad in South Central and Watts that families started leaving in large numbers. Those who had money went to the Merino Valley, but the less fortunate had to find other ways to leave. Public housing residents from Nickerson Gardens or Grape Street chose to move into different public housing complexes. They assumed that other projects like San Fernando Gardens or Ramona Gardens would be much safer. But that was hardly the case. Once these residents moved into the gardens, Big Hazard was not happy. They didn't want anyone else living in what they claimed to be their territory. In reality, it all belongs to the government, but you get the point. So in 1993, Big Hazard decided to set the new residents' apartments on fire. This caused the residents to move back where they came from. And sadly, this wouldn't be the last time that this would occur. And that that takes us to 2014. Big Hazard got fed up with more and more South Central residents moving into the Ramona Gardens. And that's when a 36 year old named Carlos Hernandez came up with a major plan. Mother's Day 2014. Carlos decides to roll up t-shirts, pour gas on them, and then walk up to the new residence apartments. He then flicked his lighter and you know the rest. This incident caught the national spotlight and LAPD ended up putting a $100,000 reward. So somebody cashed in and Carlos Hernandez got 22 years. And not only would this affect him, but Big Hazard ended up catching a huge indictment later in the year. Operation Resident Evil. 38 members went down. So now we're in the present day and East LA is better than it ever has been. These days, it's very rare to see something go down. And if you don't believe me, please go check out LA Times Crime Map. Locals will also tell you that the neighborhood has changed for the better. Physically, much of it is run down, but what matters most is the safety of the community. These days, car shows are huge in East LA and nothing negative ever happens. Peter Centinello recently did a vlog showing everyone the culture. So if you're in LA, please don't be afraid to visit East LA. Everything is good now. The Maravillas and White Fence still do exist in smaller numbers, but the tensions are low. And just like anywhere you go, if you're respectful, humans will respect you back, plain and simple. But what do you guys think was the key to improving the community? And that's gonna do it for this episode of Swamp Stories. If you enjoyed the video, make sure to leave a like and subscribe. Peace!